Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our study through Gibran's The Prophet. This is our second lecture in our some 30 lecture series, uh, The Coming of the Ship. This is going to be the setting up of a whole bunch of what's got to happen. And in this regards, we're going to have a, 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 a echoes to the Platonic Dialogues as uh, we think about the whole notion of conversation. Now, for those of you who are, and I hope all of you are, uh, fans of Pete Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy, of course, the extended version, thank you, uh, you're, you're, you're going to be reminded of that final scene in the third film, The Return of the King, when we have the ship. So there's going to be a lot about sailing and ships that we'll have to do here. Now, our assumptions or that you've been following our stuff already at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, you'll see our playlist there, The Prophet. And I'm hopeful that you've already been exposed to our intro lecture. And that will set you up then for our study here. Now, some background information. I mentioned Plato. So, you'll remember in our study of Plato, and uh, of course those final days of Socrates, as it's often re referred to, uh, um, the Euthyphro, and then of course you'll have the uh, Apology, and then Crito, and then I'm really more interested in that last, the Phaedo, where Socrates is sitting with his students, his disciples, his pals, and the, the Hemlock Shake is sitting right there on the table. Yes, he, he will soon drink the poison, because he's been convicted of uh, what, uh, um, atheism and, uh, and of course, the uh, you know, ruining the youth of Athens. But he's not upset at all. He's excited. He's giddy. He's ready to go on his next journey. We're going to have a whole lot of that, I think, happening here as well. Now, Al-Mufasa is the Arabic for the chosen one, sometimes are understood as the blessed one, the prophet. And Al-Mufasa will be the one who will be speaking at the beginning of this text. I want us to pay attention as you get into the annotation of this uh, first opening passage. I want to pay attention to what is often referred to as the writing style or the poetic style. Some have called it the romantic style of Gibran. There's going to be a whole lot of imagery going on here. I want you to pay attention to the paradoxes that will be at play here. And, of course, all kinds of poetic um, types of language as well. Aphorisms will be a key part of our study. This romantic voice will remind us in some regards of, uh, of, a, of a Whitman, of an Emerson. Um, and there's going to be a lot of emotions that will be involved in this as well. Now... Uh, I'm going to read, and as I read, we'll annotate. It is my hope, as I said in my intro lecture, you have your own copy of the prophet. My hope is that uh, you're annotating as you go, and then obviously coming to us for some observations along the way. Al-Mufasa, the chosen, and the beloved, who was a dawn unto his own day, had waited 12 years in the city of Orphalis for his ship that was to return and bear him back to the Isle of his birth. So, you know, you can read this as literal, you can read this obviously as symbolic or metaphoric. It's time to go on a journey. Obviously, Homer's Odyssey is standing behind a whole lot of this. And in the twelfth year, on the seventh day of Ailu, the month of reaping, and that's significant as we get into this uh, passage, he climbed the hill. Think about the power of that idea, right? Go back to Song of Myself, passage 46 when he says, I take you on a knoll. He climbed the hill without the city walls and looked seaward, and he beheld a ship coming with the mist. Then the gates of his heart were flung open, and his joy flew far over the sea, and he closed his eyes and prayed in the silences of his soul. Think about the power of seeing the ship that's coming that's going to take him back home. But, and notice here already our paradoxes, as he descended the hill, a sadness came upon him, and he thought in his heart, now we're going to get some speculation. Notice we move from joy to sorrow, sadness, right? How shall I go in peace and without sorrow? Notice all the rhetorical questions that are a part of the prophet. Every time you see one, just pay attention to it. How shall I go in peace and without sorrow? Nay, not without a wound in the spirit shall I leave this city. That is to say, parting, obviously, is sad. Long were the days of pain I've spent within its walls, and long were the nights of aloneness. And who can depart from his pain and his aloneness without regret? Well, this is one of the first obvious paradoxes. Here we are with the question of theodicy. What do you do with all this pain and sorrow and aloneness? Well, he says, you can't depart from all of that without some sense of regret. Why? 
because we must learn to ask not why did this happen to me, but rather why did this happen for me. We're going to see this theodistic argument made over and over again in, in, in the prophet. Too many fragments of the Spirit, what a brilliant way to say it, right? Too many fragments of the Spirit have I scattered in these streets, and too many are the children of my longing that walk naked among these hills, and I cannot withdraw from them without a burden and an ache. You'll remember in the song of myself, 48, he says, why do I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God every day. I find letters of God dropped in the street, and I leave them where they are. Notice here, we've got these scattered fragments, right? It is not a garment I cast off this day, but a skin that I tear with my own hands. Again, that idea of transcending and including that evolutionary idea will be central to our reading of Gibran's uh, uh, philosophy. Nor is it a thought I leave behind me, but a heart made sweet with hunger and with thirst. We're back to that idea of you can't, have, you can't leave your pain without some sense of regret. Yet, I cannot tarry longer. It's time to go. The sea that calls all things unto her calls me, and I must embark. We think, obviously, the Odyssey. For to stay, though the hours burn in the night, is to freeze and crystallize and be bound in a mold. The power of movement will be central to our reading of the prophet. The need, the necessity to always be moving forward, to be evolving. Fain would I take with me all that is here, but... How shall I? You're going to get this kind of rhetorical question over and over in prophet. How shall I do it? A voice cannot carry the tongue, and the lips that gave it wings, alone it must seek the ether. The, the, notice the brilliance of this, that the tongue itself does not produce a voice. Right? And alone, notice his repetitions of alone, and alone without his nest shall the eagle fly across the sun. In other words, the past must remain in the past as we move forward. Transcend and include. Now, we're back from his, from his self-reflective thoughts. Now, when he reached the foot of the hill, he turned again towards the sea, and he saw a ship approaching the harbor, and upon her prow the mariners, the men of his own land. And his soul cried out to them, and he said, notice now the second articulation, sons of my ancient mother, you riders of the tides, how often have you sailed in my dreams, and now you come in my awakening, a key word in, in uh, the, all of these poems, awakening, which is my deeper dream. Ready am I to go, my eagerness with sails full set awaits the wind. Only another breath will I breathe in the still air. Only another loving look cast backward, one last glance backward. And then I shall stand among you, a seafarer among seafarers. We can't help but think of the Exeter book in our treatment of those great classic poems, Seafarer and Wanderer. Go back and look at LearnStrong.net to see those lectures. And you, vast sea, sleep his mother. So notice, first he speaks to his mariners, then he speaks directly to the sea. And you, vast sea, sleepless mother, who alone are peace and freedom to the river and the stream. Only another winding will this stream make. Only another murmur in this glade, the brilliance, of course, of the imagery here. And then... I shall come to you, a boundless drop to a boundless ocean. One of those brilliant insights that we'll have shared over and over again that we're all connected in some profound way. We're each a drop in a, in a majestic ocean. And as he walked, notice the movement now. He saw from afar men and women leaving their fields and their vineyards and hastening towards the city gates. And he heard their voices calling his name and shouting from field to field, telling one another of the coming of a ship. So now all of a sudden we move from the, uh, from the prophet himself, solitary, now to all these people that he's lived among. And he said to himself, now we're back to the third speech, shall the day of parting be the day of gathering? Again, a little the month of reaping, right? Gathering, and shall it be said that my eve was in truth my dawn? which is a fascinating way to think about it, right? Um, again, notice all these powerful questions, these rhetorical questions. And what shall I give unto him who has left his plow in mid-furrow, or to him who has stopped the wheel of his wine press? One more time, this question, what do I have to give to you? It's a very Socratic idea. I have nothing to give because I don't know anything. The only thing I know is that I don't know, you'll remember Socrates said. Shall my heart become a tree? One of the powerful images of the prophet is a tree. A tree heavy laden with fruit that I may gather and give unto them. This idea of the tree that gives of its own volition freely is going to be part of his uh, passage on giving later. And shall my desires flow like a fountain that I may fill their cups. This idea of the fountain and filling is going to be central as well. 
in my heart that the hand of the mighty may touch me or a flute that his breath may pass through me. This idea that um, Al-Mufasa the, the, is going to be, the prophet is going to be like a conduit to produce the music that will then be shared with obviously his listeners and obviously with us. He says, a seeker of silences am I. And, and this is central, this idea of being a seeker. Obviously, Tennyson's Ulysses comes to mind. To follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought is what he'll say is the great challenge. We give a full lecture on it at LearnStrong.net. A seeker of silences am I. And what treasure have I found in silences that I may dispense with confidence? If this is my day of harvest... In what fields have I sowed the seed, and in what unremembered seasons? If this indeed be the hour in which I lift up my lantern, it is not my flame that shall burn therein. We're all connected, right? Empty and dark shall I raise my lantern. We can't help but think of Nietzsche's madman passage here, right? And the guardian of the night shall fill it with oil, and he shall light it also. The idea of light, the, 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 the symbolism of light, and obviously we think of our Plato immediately, right? These things he said in words. But much in his heart remained unsaid, for he himself could not speak his deeper secret. It's going to be that inability, that translinguistic quality of truth that will be central to our reading of the prophet. And when he entered into the city, all the people came to meet him, and they were crying out to him as with one voice. And the elders of the city stood forth and said, quote, Go not yet away from us, a noontide. Have you been in our twilight and your youth has given us dreams to dream? No stranger are you among us, nor a guest, but our son and our dearly beloved. Suffer not yet our eyes to hunger for your face. Please don't leave. And the priest and the priestesses said unto him, Let not the waves of the sea separate us now. And the years you've spent in our midst become a memory. You've walked among us a spirit. And your shadow, notice the second time shadow has been used, has been a light upon our faces. We can't help but think of, uh, of uh, Plato's Republic 7, right? In the cave allegory. Much have we loved you, but speechless was our love. And with veils has it been veiled. Yet now it cries aloud unto you and would stand revealed before you. And ever has it been that love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. It's only in loss that we come to really fully appreciate love. What We're going to get to love, obviously, in the first full poem of the, of, of the prophet. And others came also and entreated him, but he answered them not. He only bent his head, and those who stood near saw his tears falling upon his breast, and he and the people proceeded towards the great square before the temple. So here we go, now the next movement of the narrative. And there came out of the sanctuary a woman whose name was Altimra, and she was a seeress. And he looked upon her with exceeding tenderness, for it was she who had first sought and believed in him when he had been but a day in their city. And she hailed him, saying, Prophet of God, in quest of the utmost, long have you searched the distances for your ship, and now your ships come, and you must needs go. Deep is your longing for the land of your memories and the dwelling place of your greater desires. And our love would not bind you, nor our needs hold you. Yet this we ask, ere you leave us, that you will speak to us and give us of your truth. Here in a little bit it's going to be disclosed. And we will give it unto our children, and they unto their children, and it shall not perish, this idea of passing on, this central to our reading of prophet, the idea that the most important things have to be passed on. Guys, that is your education. That's why we say we're the stories that we tell and the stories that we retell. Of course, we've also said we're the stories we decide to accept or to reject, no question. But you can't reject a story until you know it, right? In your aloneness, you have watched with our days. And in your wakefulness, you have listened to the weeping and the laughter of our sleep. Now, therefore... Disclose us to ourselves, central teaching in the prophet, that we all come to truth in our own way and in our own time. And tell us all that has been shown you of that which is between birth and death. And there it is, right? I mean, that's essentially what all great teaching, all great poetry will do. It tells us what is between our birth and our and our leaving. And now for the last time he'll answer. People of Orphalese. Of what can I speak, save of that which is even now moving within your soul? Sounding very much like Socrates, I have nothing to teach you that you don't already know. 
my job is to help you remember. The idea here is that the only sin is to forget. I'm going to help you to remember what you already know. And of course, the poems now to follow will be, in fact, those very kinds of rememberings, hopefully. Well, how are we going to deal with a passage like this at 2A? Well, I think the argument that he's making is that we all come to truth in our own way and in our own time. And when we come, there's a recognition that we know much of this already. And uh, we're going to argue this. There is nothing new under the sun, the great writer of Ecclesiastes will say in the biblical tradition. And, of course, we're going to be playing a similar game. Most of what Gibran will say in this text, you guys will already know. It's just a matter of, oh, yeah, remembering. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. At 2B, I love this Socratic voice. I love the paradoxes. I, uh, I, I love that he'll point out again and again that the only um, way there that, that they'll ever they'll ever be able to know anything is to remember what they already know. Right? Socrates will remember to said that. I, the only thing I know is I don't know anything. At three a, we mentioned the dialogues of Plato, especially from Crito to Phaedo, and the way in which that exchange happens. It's going to be here, um, and then of course the the idea that he's about to leave. We mentioned of course Tennyson's Ulysses as well. Finally, at 3B, how can you own a passage like this? What was the time that you had to say goodbye? And how hard was it for you to say goodbye? And then the other question is, who has been your albafus? That is to say, in your life, who has been that provider of guidance and wisdom as you've moved forward? Well, we're going to move now to our first poem of this after we have our set up, his conversation on love. Come back. That'll be fun. Thank you.